Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody formally to this edition of Zoom with COA. Uh, my name is Alan Jay. I'm the Acting uh, Director, National Director of Outreach and Engagement here at COA. Uh, I'd like to just set some ground rules as we start this program. The title of the program is Jewish Artisanship in Judea and Samaria, a study of biblical Jewish artisanship still in use today, featuring Eliana Passantine and the Binyamin Council, and moderated by Dan Lutz, who I'll intro also in just a moment. Please leave your microphones on mute. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the, of the session. Please use the Zoom chat feature located at the bottom of your screen <coughs> to post your questions. And we'll get to as many questions at the end of the program as possible. Again, we'd like to remind you that we're gonna leave all microphones on mute for the duration of the program so that everybody can enjoy the program. And so that the questions can be um, handled in a very efficient manner. Uh, since the pandemic began, ZOA started a program of, um, of webinars, running various webinars with uh, people from both Israel and the United States. We've had uh, politicians and people from the press. Uh, we've had other um, dignitaries that have joined us. And it's our effort to keep you folks informed, even though we're kind of on a lockdown. Uh, and we hope that everybody remains safe and healthy uh, for the duration. Um, and I've mentioned so many times that uh, the ZOA has been in the forefront of Israel advocacy and combating anti-Semitism since 1897. We do that through education. We have a Center for Law and Justice at Department of Government Relations, a campus division. We have regions around the country, uh, and we tell and teach people about the uh, history, facts, truth, defending and demonstrating Israel's right to be and to remain a sovereign Jewish state including Judea, Samaria, and the Jordan Valley, with Jerusalem as her undivided capital <clears throat> and with the right to defend herself if and whenever necessary. I'm gonna pass the, the uh, program over to Dan. Dan is our ZOA representative in Israel. He's originally from Montreal, Canada. He moved to Israel after finishing his legal studies at McGill University and specializing in international law. Dan serves as an international law advisor on the reserve duty and has worked in the International Law Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a legislative advisor to the Likud and Knesset, <coughs> I'm sorry, as well as in senior management positions in Israel's third sector. Dan, I'm going to give you the program. Have a wonderful program, and thank you to our guests. I look forward to uh, learning a lot today. Thank you very much, Alan, and welcome everyone to this very interesting webinar. Uh, as Alan said, my name is Daniel Luz, and I am ZOA's representative in Israel. My job is basically to create a bridge between ZOA's important work uh, and Israel. This includes bringing you quality content from Israel, like the content we're going to be listening to today, but also letting Israelis know about ZOA's important work. In a time when Isra Israelis hear constantly about post-Zionist voices coming out of the Jewish community in the United States, it is critical for the Israeli public and decision makers especially to hear about ZOA's work. Too many times people in Israel are afraid to make the right decisions because they fear creating a drift between Israel and the diaspora Jews. When they hear about the unapologetic, staunchly Zionist positions of ZOA, they then understand that there is support for these decisions and that they can make the right decisions without fear. This is, this is one of the many reasons why ZOA's work is so important. Today, we have an incredible program. This is actually the second time that we are hosting the Binyamin Regional Council and their tour guide, Eliana Passantin, for a tour in the Binyamin region. The reason why we, ho we are hosting them a second time is because we had such positive responses the last time we hosted Eliana that we knew we just had to have her back on. Because we know that a lot of people had a lot of questions last time, we asked Eliana to stay a little bit longer so this program will be somewhere between an hour and an hour and 15 minutes. Most of our programs are usually one hour, but we'll try to go a little bit longer this time to allow for questions. Please note, as Alan said, that you can put questions in the chat at all times, but we will get to them only at the end of the program. Eliana will be discussing some of the fascinating businesses in the Binyamin region today. 
uh, that renew some of the craftsmanship that existed in this area 2,000 years ago. As you probably know, the Binyamin region is part of Judea and Samaria, a historically Jewish land. After all, the word Jew comes from the word Judea. So it's a historically Jewish land where the international community wants to establish an Arab state. Yet in this webinar, we will hear how Jews today are doing the very same thing, things Jews were doing on this land 2000 years ago, showing incredible roots and continuity. This webinar is part of our sovereignty series, and we believe this is a great symbol of our historical rights to this land that justify applying sovereignty to the region. Before turning to Eliana, I want to invite Miri Maozovadia from the Binyamin Regional Council to say a few words. Miri Maozovadia is 32 years old, married with three children, and she lives in the community of Nevet Suf, which is located in the west of the Binyamin region. Miri is the International Desk Director for the Binyamin Regional Council and has been a spokesperson for the Yesha Council since 2012. She has hosted hundreds of international delegations throughout the region and has been responsible for various projects focusing on ad advocating for Judea and Samaria and, bin and the Binyamin communities. We are very happy to have you here today, Miri, and would love to hear from you. Thank you, Dan, and shalom and good evening. Good evening or good morning for everybody who's participating in this session. I wanna thank Dan, Alan, Jackin, and Eliana in advance for helping us put together this special opportunity I think one of the things that we lack most these days is the most natural opportunity of meeting people. Here in the Benjamin region, which is in the heartland of Israel, we have over 1 million tourists a year, visitors from Israel, from out of Israel, who come here to the different parts of the region. Some of the areas more deserty like, others more forest, like the area where I live. We have an amazing combination of places, of people, of natural reserves, and different historical periods that formed the history of our nation. And uh, our biggest hope is that this pandemic will end as fast as possible. And once again, it will be pos possible for all of you to come here, to travel, to see the, see the area and meet the people. I think one of the most special things that we have here is really the people living over here who are busy creating very special things. Sometimes their creation is linked directly to creation that has been happening here for thousands of years. And that is something that Eliana is going to shed light on in the session that we're going to have today. Many of the stories of the regular people who live here get to national news many times and inspire many other people over the land of Israel to do good, to do chesed, and to create positive things to contribute to the nation of Israel. Benjamin today is the largest authority in Israel. We have 80,000 residents living in 48 communities, religious, secular, ultra-Orthodox, Olim, new immigrants from many countries around the world, as well as um, Israelis, second, third, fourth, fifth generation, who all together partner and are making the next link of the Jewish chain that has been going on for so many years. From here on a daily basis, I'm, we have a very special site, Ancient Shiloh. Those of you who have participated in the previous session with Eliana got the opportunity to have a very special uh, view, vision into this place. Um, we pray in our hearts from, from, from our homes here in Israel that there'll be peace and that there'll be health for all the people soon. And that once again, like I said, our world will once become the place that we're so familiar with and that we love and we can meet the people that we love. Um, it, was, it is my um, great pleasure to introduce Eliana, who's been a tour guide and a content creator for many, many years here in the region. I think there's no other person that is so... Um, capable of connecting between people, between places, between the people of Israel and their heritage. And I want to thank Eliana in advance for preparing very, very hard for this session. Um, so thank you. And uh, let's start. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can you all hear me? I'm okay, Dan. Thank you, Alan, Dan, Jackie, and Mary for uh, having me again. Um, this is a real pleasure and honor. Uh, the reason why I had to prepare for this tour, it, it's, I wouldn't call it a virtual tour, it's more of a lecture, but I really want to bring you to the region. And so I spent a long time looking for beautiful photos uh, so you can really get the feel of where we're going. I'm Eliana Passantine. I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. I came on Aliyah with my parents when I was 11 to Herzliya Pituach, which is right on the coast by Tel Aviv. 
I uh, spent my high school years surfing and after the army, I made another aliyah up to the mountains of Binyamin. Uh, the Binyamin region is a beautiful region. And from my backyard, I can see three of Israel's borders. Um, this week, there we had a small Corona wedding in a backyard of a friend. And I climbed up to the rooftop of another friend's house to take pictures of the wedding. And all of a sudden I was looking at the sunset and I saw the sun setting on the, on the Mediterranean, Tel Aviv, and just less than an hour drive from my home. But you could see a, a ship in the ocean. I took photos and I posted on Facebook and it was just, it, it's amazing. This is a beautiful, very special region. And I would like to share just a little bit, give you a little bit of a taste of Binyamin. So we're gonna start with, with a map of the region so you can see where we are in Israel. Okay, so we will begin. So as Miri said, this is the largest regional council in Israel. Um, and we're beginning our tour from Jerusalem. You can imagine you spent the night in Jerusalem. It's a Sunday morning and we're on the bus on the tour. We are leaving Jerusalem and driving north on Highway 60. Now, as soon as we get onto the highway, as soon as we leave Jerusalem, we are going back to the time of the Tanakh, to the time of the Bible. We passed on the way Tel El Ful, which is Givat Shaul of Shaul, King Saul, Chizme, Geva, and Michmas. Our first stop, as you can see here, is Maale Michmas. And Highway 60, if you see going up north, is also known as the Highway of the patriarchs, because this is where Abraham was walking back and forth. Jacob was walking back and forth. And Beit El, Jacob's famous dream, Joseph, when he, after he receives the coat of many colors, is sent by his father to look for his brothers, goes all the way up north to the top of the map. We don't see Shechem here or Dotan on this map because this is the Binyamin region. Uh, also called Binyamin because of the tribal inheritance of Benjamin. Part of the area is also the tribal inheritance of Ephraim. But you can see on one hand, we're close to Ben Gurion Airport and Tel Aviv. On the other side, we're close to the Dead Sea and Jerusalem. So it's a really large regional council with lots of history and a lot of stories to tell. So let's start with the Michmas Valley. You can see where we are, where we're located. And we're gonna start, sorry, with the story of Saul and Jonathan in the Valley of Michmas. So if you were coming on a tour with me today, I would take you to the New Goat Winery and we'd stop at the beautiful Outlook and look down at this valley. And what does it say in the book of Samuel 1, chapter 13? It's the story of Shaul and Yonatan fighting the Plishtim. Now the Plishtim, the Philistines, are usually down in the southern coast of Israel, where Ashkelon or Ashdod is. Now, if we're reading in the book of Samuel 1 that the Plishtim are, have come all the way up to the mountain, that means that we have a problem. Because if the enemy will climb the mountain to fight King Saul, it means they're not afraid at all. And when we read the verses in Samuel 1, we'll see that King Saul, it says, Jonathan decides to go to the Plishtim. But before that, it says that Shaul is sitting in Migron. Where exactly is Migron? Let's move back. We don't know where, where biblical Migron is exactly. This is modern Migron. But King Saul is sitting up on one of these mountains looking down at Michmas, at the Michmas Valley. And what does he see? He sees thousands of Philistines, the Plishtim, Plishtim that have come up from the valley and he's stuck with only 600 men. Most of his men have fled to the desert. He doesn't know what to do. He's looking down at the valley and everyone's afraid. But Jonathan, his son, decides to do something crazy. He decides to repel down the cliff. Can you see um, in this valley over here, there's a cliff. Now there are two cliffs, one on either side. And this is a closer look at the cliffs. They're, they're still there today. You can go hiking in this beautiful valley and you'll see two cliffs and they're mentioned here in the Tanakh. 
One is called Sene and the other is called Botzet. Shen Hasela Mea Everze, the Shen Hasela Mea Everze, Shema Echad Botzet, the Shema Echad Sene. They have names. There are two major cliffs. You can't miss it. Topography is the same. You go hiking in this valley, and here it is. So, what does Jonathan do? No iPhones, ancient times, can't call his father. He knows that the Plishtim are down here in this valley. What he decides to do is to repel down this cliff and to surprise them. It's a narrow valley, as you can see, very, very narrow. And he says, God can decide if we can win the battle a few against many. Now, as I said, there were only 600 soldiers on the Israelite side and hundreds and thousands of Plishtim. But we're not talking about 600 against hundreds and thousands. We're talking about two soldiers because they have no way to tell King Saul. King Shaul. So they start repelling down into the valley and Shaul and, and Yonatan says to his armed bearer that's, that's with him on this, on this journey, God will give us a sign if we can win the war. If they're prepared and they say hands up, that means they're prepared for war, they're ready, we're going to climb back up the mountain and forget we ever climbed down. But if they say, hello boys, you know, like, what's happening? It means they're not prepared. And what does it say? They say, it says that the Plishtim casually look up and what do they see? If you can see, there's a smaller um, photo over here of a cave. This valley has lots and lots of karstic caves. So these caves have been here for, they were there thousands of years ago when Shaul and Yonatan were fighting this battle. And Yonatan with his arms bare, they, they climb out and surprise the Plishtim. And what do they say? The Hebrews are coming out of their holes. Like there are mice coming out of the holes. Oh, so they're coming out. Maybe they're, they, they've given up and, and they're not even afraid. And what Yonatan and his armed bearer do, they repel quickly down the mountain and they kill 20 men. Now what it says here, there's a whole story in the Tanakh, Samuel 1 chapters 13 and 14 about great confusion and commotion. The Plishtim start to kill each other. Now, don't, if you remember, King Saul, King Shaul is up on the mountain looking down at this valley, does not have a clue what's happening, but can see them retreating through the valley. He takes the 600 men, they go running down into the valley and they finish off the Plishtim. And this is the famous battle of Shaul and Yonatan. Now, if you were with me in, 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 in Sagot Winery, looking down at the valley, you'd say, wow, amazing. Here's this winery with this great story. It's a biblical story, it's a true story, great, but the story doesn't end here. World War I, the British are fighting the Turks and the British are moving in, moving up north, just like we are on our journey today, trying to conquer the land of Israel from the Turks. Now in this exact same valley, the Turks are situated, they're camped out and the British commander who's planning the attack against the Turks says, Michmas, wait a minute, Michmas. Now, I just want to say that I forgot to tell you that today in this immediate area, there's a Jewish town called Michmas because it reminds us of the Valley of Michmas. And there's an Arab village called Muchmas because the Arabs preserve ancient historical names. There's another Arab village called Jaba, which is Geva. Geva is the town of Shaul. And it says that the valley is in between Michmas and Geva. So here we have it. So this um, British soldier, the British commander says, wait a minute, Michmas, Michmas, I know the name, rings a bell, bring me my Bible. At the light of the candle, he reads his Bible, chapters, Samuel 1, chapter 13 and 14, and he reads about Michmas and about Saul and Jonathan and the cliffs. And he sends trackers, they come back and they say, they're the two cliffs. This is the valley, it must be the exact same place. He changes the battle tactics and decides that instead of sending a huge battalion to send one small platoon of soldiers at night to surprise the Turks. The Turks are totally surprised. They are sure that they're surrounded by Allenby, General Allenby's army and they start fleeing with great confusion and commotion. Thus, thousands of years later, the British win the Battle of Michmas using the battle tactics of Saul and Jonathan. Now that's a great story. But I want to tell you another story. This is the new and beautiful um, Sagot Winery. And it, it's, it's brand new. No tourists from abroad have been here yet. And this is a photo taken uh, at my son's wedding. We just married him off two months ago. 
at the Psagot Winery. This is the chuppah we made for him. But this is the only photo I have, like an aerial photograph I have. So just behind the chuppah is the beautiful valley that I just showed you in another photo. So when you're imagining your next trip to Israel and your, and your journey to Binyamin, you'll definitely want to stop at the Psagot Winery, which has, has a whole other story that I'm saving for another virtual tour or a real tour when you come to Israel. But the winery is situated at the edge of the valley, the Valley of Michmas. We're going to move on. I just want to share one, one more thing that I forgot to add. I didn't know how much time I'd have, and I love telling stories. But if you can see this, this is a bombshell from World War I found across the street from where I live in Ailey. Um, and the story, it's, I'll just tell you a quick story. We find, uh, I found a, a pipe belonging to a Turkish soldier in my backyard. They sat, they were fighting on, on the hilltops of Binyamin, the Turks and the British. This is a British bombshell that fell to where we were going to create a, we were gonna build a, a playground. And we started building the playground. They came with the with the bulldozers and everything. Um, all of a sudden, I get I hear uh, everybody's yelling. Every, there's a bomb. There's a bomb. They send all the kids to our bomb shelter. Everybody has like a mamad, a bomb shelter in Israel. All these kids come running in. They say there's a bomb. There's a bomb. I said what kind of a bomb? They said something very ancient. I said wait a minute. I shoved all the kids in the bomb shelter. I took my camera. I ran to take the picture, and there it was, uh, a, a bombshell that had not gone off from World War One. And later on, uh, the army came and then they dug a big, uh, deep uh, hole and everything. And, and it went off and there was this huge explosion. But that's part of life here. We find remnants of World War I all the time. Uh, so that's a great story. We're on to our next stop. Oh, this is what Psycho Winery looks like. This is also for my son's wedding. My friend Tovi took these photos. And our next stop is Kochav Hashachar. Okay, so we were, at my, we were looking at Michmas from uh, Psagot, Psagot Winery. We were not all the way up in Psagot. We were down in Psagot Winery in the Shar Binyamin uh, shopping center. And now we are in Kochav HaShachar, Kochav HaShachar, 400 families. Um, I like to call this area the five towns of, of Jerusalem because it's like the, the new suburbs, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minute drive from Jerusalem. We have a lot of Olim from all over the world coming to live here because they want the suburbs, they want the view, they want the history, but close proximity to Jerusalem. So 400 families, families established in 1980. A lot of people work in agriculture. There's a high school yeshiva, they have a quarry and a really special business that I wanna tell you about right now. So the business I'm going to introduce you to is called Adva Natural Soaps. And it is owned by Shlomo Keshet who used to live in Gush Katif, and then he was working in Meshek Achia, the Achia olive press. He knows a lot about agriculture, a lot about olive oil, likes cooking, and he had this idea. Um, Shlomo and his wife were blessed with El Natan, uh, who has Down syndrome. And when El Natan got to a certain age, they were thinking, they were thinking about his future, and they thought to establish a small uh, factory where El Natan and his friends could work and create these soaps. So they make the natural herb from natural herbs, herbs that are mentioned in the Bible. They go picking them in the, in the mountains, essential oils, uh, dead sea mud and salts. They make the most wonderful, um, fragrant natural soaps. Uh, they're called Adva. And these are the, the workers. There is Didi on the left from uh, Ofra. Ariel, his story is really, it's, it's a tragic story, but, but he's so happy to work at Adva. He was perfectly healthy 19 year old who had a motorcycle accident and then he had severe brain damage and became paralyzed. And Shlomo saw him at shul and he saw that he could move his left hand and that was about it. He said to his father, he said, you know, I have a great job for, for Ariel because I need someone to manually stamp each soap, and that's Ariel's job. He comes in every day and, he's, and he, he's, he can pick up the stamp, that's the only thing he can move, and he stamps the Adva on the soaps. El Natan is the next one in line, and Shira, who loves the fragrance, loves wrapping, you can read about them on the website. And when you come on our tour, uh, you'll be met by the sweet fragrance of these wonderful soaps and cosmetics and these wonderful young adults working and so happy to be able to have a job, 
make a living, meet friends, meet groups. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, um, it's a beautiful company. I personally love Adva because it, on, on my personal story, um, we're three uh, biological children and my parents really wanted to have more children. Uh, eventually they, they decided it's time to adopt. And in Israel, uh, they wanted to adopt a baby. And in Israel, there are no uh, babies up for adoption uh, that are healthy. And someone called my parents and said, look, there's a Down syndrome baby, if you're willing, whatever. To make a long story short, I have four brothers with uh, Down syndrome, all adopted from birth, all abandoned in the hospital. So this um, initiative is very, very close to my heart. And I love taking groups here because I know that, yeah, especially young adults with Down syndrome uh, love people and love company. And it just, it just, it's a special visit. It's special, pun, no pun intended, but okay. Our next stop is Yossi Gur Arye. Now we're going to go back to the Tanakh. V'charash lo yimatze b'chol eretz Yisrael, ki amru ha'plishtim pen ya'asu ha'ivrim cherev uchanit. So here we are back in Shmuel Aleph, back in Samuel 1, chapters 13 and 14, just before the battle of Saul and Jonathan in the Valley of Michmas. Now, why was King Shaul so worried about this battle, about these plishtim coming up? Because they had no weapons. It says, There was no blacksmith. The Israelites could not uh, work the land with their tools. They had no tools. If they wanted to fix a tool or make a tool, they had to go all the way down to Ashdod, Ashkelon, on the southern coast of Israel to the Plishtim to purchase or make or fix. No blacksmith, which means they couldn't have weapons. They couldn't fight. They couldn't protect themselves. And if it wasn't for the bravery of Yonatan and, and the miracle from God, they would have lost this battle. But here we are driving down, driving up north on Highway 60 to the town of Ofra. And in Ofra, we're going to meet Yossi Gurarie, a blacksmith. A Harash Barzel is a blacksmith. There were no blacksmiths. You could not make weapons. And today, in the beautiful days, uh, the modern days today, where we have Airbnbs and restaurants, and artisans and small companies and workshops. You can come with your family. You can come on your own to meet Yossi uh, Gurarie. And what Yossi Gurarie does, this was his dream. And he was actually, I met him when he was working uh, for an aluminum company. He actually did the windows in my house when we built our home. But he always had a dream to become a blacksmith. And his wife said, you know, I'm sending you to this course. I want you to go up north to the Galilee. This is your passion and you should really learn it. And he started learning and then he started teaching. And today he has this beautiful workshop in the town of Ofra. And he believes that, you know, there was no blacksmith during the time of Shaul and of Yonatan. But today uh, in this modern era, era, when we're free in our country in the land of Israel, he is, there is now a blacksmith and that makes him very happy. So as I said, it was a hobby it was a hobby and now he teaches and he and he, he does private commissions, menorahs, mezuzahs, railings and family workshops. And I came on a tour last year with a family from New York where they wanted something hands-on for the kids, for the parents and what Yossi does is he explains and then he, and then we get to you know, wear all, of, all the gear and to help him and, it, and it's really great for the family. And then he showed us, he said he's going, he's, go, he's supposed to be going to Italy in, uh, in a week or two for a competition. He's really nervous, it's in Tuscany. And, and, and this competition is for three days, but when it's your turn, there's a topic. I can't remember what his topic was. And he has to create his creation with only one person helping him under three hours. If three hours pass and it's not finished, it, it's just you know nothing you can do about it. And he worked really hard and it was a week before the competition. He was working for hours and practicing and he showed us his, his finished product. And we said, it's amazing. You're probably gonna win something with Leonardo da Vinci. And he said, yeah, but I did it in three hours and 15 minutes. And he just couldn't, or, or three hours and a half. And he didn't think he'd be able to actually make it in time. He went to Italy knowing that he, he hasn't practiced enough at home and he ended up winning the competition. We were all so proud of him. You know, settler from Pinyamin, Yossi, 
in Tuscany winning first prize on this beautiful creation. Um, and he told me a story, a really great story. Nails, blacksmiths have made nails from early periods of time. You can see one of the handmade nails that he had. He always shows you how to make a nail and he tells you the story. So I'm trying to bring Yossi and his, and his beautiful studio to life. Nails were hard to obtain and therefore people would actually burn down their own homes to collect the nails when they moved and they, take, they would take them to build their new home. And if you look up, there's a Virginia law from the 1640s that forbade the burning of buildings for the nails. Okay, there was a law in the United States. That you're not allowed to burn down your home to collect the nails. And I'll tell you another story about nails, a Corona wedding. I don't know what it's, what's happening in the States, but in Israel for a very long time, we haven't been able to have a real simcha, a real wedding. And uh, Yossi was talking to his friend and, and this friend also knows that Yossi is a blacksmith and that he has a thing with nails and he likes making nails. And he said, I have to tell you this story, Yossi. He says, my daughter just got married, you know, Corona style wedding, 20 people here, 20 people sitting over here, had to be outdoors and not in a real wedding hall. So we didn't know what to do. The girls from the Golan Heights, they went driving up to the Golan. They found this big open space on a farm. They said, this is perfect for the wedding. But the day of the wedding, there was a crazy wind. And the, and the, the Kala, the bride, uh, is a dancer. And she was really concerned. She wanted people to be able to dance at her wedding. And, and it was all dusty and windy. And so the, so the father had an idea. Yossi's friend, he said, you know what? We should put down mats or maybe some kind of fake grass or something. And they place it down. And then the wind comes and sweeps it up. So they quickly got nails. And they all worked together for hours. And they nailed down the mats. And they nailed down the grass. And they said it was a beautiful wedding. And he said, Yossi, I had to tell you a story about, a story about nails. And nails connect people together. And, and when you come meet Yossi, he has a whole Dvar Torah. He has a beautiful uh, saying and stories um, about nails. And if you really like the town of Ofra, I didn't know how long we'd have. And I didn't. Uh, collect photos from every single studio, but the town of Ofra, a lot of different people that live there have art studios and there are wineries in the town of Ofra. Uh, there is a, a, a bait cafe, uh, like a cafe with special needs, uh, young women uh, with different, with Down syndrome and different special needs that serve uh, the coffee. And there's a beautiful bed and breakfast called Kedem Ofra. You can stay right across the street from Yossi, have the best falafel in Israel, and then go uh, to join Yossi for a um, workshop. So we are now going to the last stop. And the last stop is Gavaot Winery and Givat Harel. So we are, we've driven north up Highway 60, Givat Harel is right across from where I live, Ailey. I actually can see them through my window right now. And Givat Harel is named for Harel Binun, uh, the son of Rav Binun from Shiloh, who was killed in a terror attack. His brothers established Givat Harel. Giva means hilltop or mountaintop. And Givaot Winery are hilltops or mountaintops. And all the names of their wines are different mountains in Israel, like Masada, Gofna, uh, et cetera. Um, this is a boutique winery producing 75,000 bottles a year. The entire area of Givat Harel um, in the summer looks like Tuscany, just beautiful, beautiful vineyards. This is Dr. Shivi Drory who established the winery. He is the vintner and he in winemaking in Ariel, um, Ariel University. So I wanna tell you his story and the story of this winery. But before I tell you Dr. Uh, Shivi's story, let's go back to the book of Bereshit, to the blessing of Yaakov to Yosef. We are in the tribal inheritance of Yosef. Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Alei Ein, which basically, I just wanna use one word. I'm not even gonna translate the whole thing. Pora, Ben Porat Yosef, the son of Yosef. Pora, Pura, one of the farmers, from the town of Shiloh about 20, 25 years ago, looks out his window and, he, and, he, and he's reading this pasuk from the book of Bereshit, which actually means Pura is the best type of grape. And there's no special blessing about grapes, but this special type of grape was supposed to grow or maybe did grow thousands of years ago in this region, in the, in the tribal inheritance of Ephraim, and what today is the Benjamin Regional Council. 
he asked himself, I'm looking out my window, all I see are olive trees, fig trees, some almond trees, a lot of bare land. He talks to an archeologist who says, did you know this in immediate area, we have uncovered thousands of ancient wine presses, thousands of ancient wine presses dating 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago. So what happened to the wine industry? He decides to plant some grapes. He gets some friends from the United States, everybody to chip in and they plant grapes. Now with grapes, according to Jewish law, years. And after the four years, he sells his grapes to the Carmel Winery. They go crazy. They say, where are these grapes from? He said, from the land of Ephraim. There's the bracha, the blessing of Yaakov to Yosef. Ben porat Yosef, ben porat Yosef. Wow. So what's happening? The terroir here is perfect. The high elevation, the hot days, the cold nights, and the terrorosa soil. Then another farmer and another farmer and another farmer start planting vineyards all over the place. And Sagot Winery, then Gvaot Winery, and Tura Winery. And these are all wineries winning gold medals in Paris. And I'm going to say something about the gold medals in, in, in just a minute. So here we have a beautiful photo of a vineyard, of Dr. Shibu Dori in his vineyard. This is, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of acres of these beautiful vineyards. But I want to say something about this grape that we see here on the right. This is not your typical grape. And Dr. Drory is not your typical vintner. They produce 75,000 bottles a year. And he has two wineries. There is the Gvote Winery, and you can come on your tour for wine tasting and barrel tasting. And adjacent to the Gvote Winery is a chef restaurant called Essa de la Sudata. If you don't want to stop at the winery, you can sit down, have your beautiful steak, looking at the Shiloh Valley. And they will serve the Gvaot wine right there for you. And sometimes Dr. Drory will come himself and tell you the story. But he asked himself a question. What kind of wine do we have in Israel? Now, Israel, there's so much about wine in Judaism. There is, it's not only Kiddush on Shabbat. Let's go back to the second temple uh, where they use wine in the Beit HaMikdash. What, there's so much history about wine. So why do we only have in Israel Cabernet? Merlot, Shiraz, Tiverdo. These are all French wines. Where is, what kind of wine did David Amelech drink? It was not Chardonnay. So what kind of wine did David Amelech drink? King David. And he asked himself this question. So the first answer, the first question is, why do we drink French wines? Because the Rothschild family in the 1880s, they want to help the Jews. And they say, look, the terroir here is similar to France. And it's okay, we can, um, we can bring the Cabernet, we can bring the, 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 the Cabernet Sauvignon, we can bring the Merlot, we can bring the Shiraz, and we plant it and make the wine. But Dr. Drory couldn't sleep at night till he found the answer to his question. So those of you who are on the tour of ancient Chilo, I can't remember if I showed you or told you, but you know that ancient Chilo is Israel's first capital. We have um, archeological finds from 3,500 years ago. And one of the finds in the fire from when the Plishtim, the Philistines came up from the valley and burnt down Chilo, the end of the story of Chilo, there's a fire. We found charred raisins, raisins from 3,500 years ago. The fire was a slow fire. The roof collapsed. The raisins were preserved. Dr. Drory took the raisins and checked the DNA on one's hand. On the other hand, he had um, tour guides all over Israel collecting wild grapes. You can see uh, that these are grapes that they collected. And he compared the DNA to the grapes. And what did he discover? He discovered uh, about seven types of grapes. Or he, he discovered 120, but out of six or seven, he decided to recreate the ancient biblical wine. Because these were grapes that were found, their seeds were found in archeological uh, excavations. He compared it to the charred raisins and he can locate the grape that's still growing in Israel today, but that was growing during the time of Joshua ben Nun, the King David, et cetera, et cetera. And he's re recreated the ancient biblical wine. He uses the local Arab names of Jandali, Hamdani, um, Bituni. These bottles of wine over here are called Vineyard Dance, because if you remember on the tour of ancient Shiloh, we, talk, we talked about the story of Tuba Av, the 15th of Av, when the women would 
would dance in their white gowns in the fields. Uh, so that's the vineyard dance. And this is, they just won 95 points, uh, gold medal, the decanter um, in France. This is a blind wine tasting. The judges do not know that it comes from this part of Israel. And so there's no, no politics involved. They just taste the wine and they get, this is, um, there were six wineries in Israel that won uh, medals. And I think four or five of them were from Judea and Samaria. Just behind the winery is an ancient wine press. You can see Dr. Drury with guests in this photo. Um, there's an ancient wine press from 2,300 years ago, which is really, really, really incredible. And a lot of the um, finds from archeological digs, um, I, I helped with a, um, a flotation project. She, Dr. Drory really, really wanted as many, uh, anything from any kind of excavation. So I said, I'm, I'm leading tours in the area. I took all my tourists to uh, volunteer, whoever wanted to come volunteer, like for a dig for a day program or dig for a morning or whatever. We came to the archeologist in Chilo and she said, okay, this is the soil that we uncovered from from an ancient uh, wine press from 2000 years ago. You're gonna take the soil, you put it in a bucket of water and whatever floats to the top, I want you to carefully go through it. And a lot of them were, were grape seeds. We put them aside with tweezers, use those for his research. And, and then he recreated the ancient uh, biblical wine, which is really exciting and amazing. It's actually excellent wine. So those, uh, the, the grape seeds that we found were from um, 1,800 years ago. His research has identi identified 120 varieties of grapes unique to the region and of, of which about 20 are suitable for making wine. And he's made just a, two or three uh, types of wine. I'd like to, before I conclude, and then uh, you can ask questions, I wanna read something. Dr. Drury is standing here in this photo overlooking the Shiloh Valley. And the entire region, it's, it's a beautiful region, uh, the, Shiloh, the Shiloh region, which is part of the Binyamin region. And we had, um, you know, besides Samuel the prophet, we were, we were talking about Samuel one, that's where we're, we were reading from before about the, the battle of Saul and Jonathan. And last time we were talking about Joshua ben Nun coming to Shiloh and Shmuel, uh, Samuel, who, uh, who grew up in the region. So we have another Samuel that was here in 1867. Maybe you'll recognize him. Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. Mark Twain comes to the region in 1867. Uh, it's the first pleasure journey, pleasure tour to Israel. And this is, I just wanna tell you what he reads about the Shiloh area and the Benjamin region. Um, Shiloh had no charms for us. We were so cold that there was no comfort, but in motion, so drowsy, we could hardly sit up on our horses. It's very cold even in the summer by us. After a while, we came to a shapeless mass of ruins, which still bears the name Bethel. It was here that Jacob lay down and that he had the superb vision of the angels, etc. The further we went, the hotter the sun got, the more rocky, bare, repulsive, and dreary the landscape became. There could have not been more fragments of stone strewn broadcast over this part of the world if every 10 square feet of the land had been occupied by a separate and distinct stone cutters establishment for an age. There was hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. Even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil had almost deserted the country. No landscape exists that is more tiresome to the eye than that which bounds the approaches to Jerusalem. Obviously, uh, things have changed a bit. A hundred years later, 1967, June 5th, when we do not want to go to war, but understand that we have no choice, the, and this becomes a war of defense. At 7.30 a.m., we discover, our intelligence discovers that all of the aircrafts of the Egyptian army land their planes, and, and at 7.30, their pilots go into the Cheder Ochel to breakfast. And that's when we decided to open with Operation Moked. And 747, we uh, demolished 75% of the aircrafts while they're still on the ground and ruined the runways. And it is said that this is what, this is how we began and won uh, the Six Day War. In the 1970s and in the early 80s, this entire area of Judea and Samaria, uh, the Jews returned home. 
the Israeli government decides to build on empty mountains, only on empty mountains. And the last 15, 20 years, the next generation living in this region have decided to build wineries and Airbnbs and homes, nature reserves, beautiful springs. We've returned home. This was just a taste of Benjamin. And if you'd like to learn more, you can go into the Benjamin region dot org dot il or on instagram at go Benjamin, which i really even if you're not on instagram uh, you should log in and see the beautiful beautiful photos of our region we really live in a one in a one of a kind region on one hand we have the desert on the other hand we're up in the mountains and it's really really um special so we invite you to come after the corona to come and see for yourself you can visit our website our instagram account i put my email here if anybody has any questions on my facebook and instagram and i'd be happy to answer i see that there are some chats and uh, i hope you enjoyed the tour and thank you very very much for joining on this beautiful sunday which if i were you i'd be out looking at the fall foliage <laughs> Dan, you'll need to unmute, or Jackie, could you unmute Dan, please? Folks, please bear with us. We're going to unmute Dan. Yes, thank you. I'm unmuted now, right? You can hear me? Great. So thanks a lot, Eliana. It was uh, fascinating, uh, just like last time, and we're very happy to have you here again. Uh, I'll start with, uh, with a technical question that someone asked. Uh, one second. Uh, it was a, a question by, sorry, one second, because of the microphone, by Michael Goodman. He asked if you knew where the source of the iron was referencing the blacksmithing. Uh, uh, where it, where was it smelted also? Which, which sort? Oh, it's in, um, I'll tell you exactly where it is. It's in Samuel 1. Samuel 1, chapter 13. Hold on, I'll tell you exactly where. Uh, chapter 13, verse 19. Okay. Okay. Uh the, ne the next question uh, is about the wine, the Gvaut winery. Uh, people are interested in knowing if they can buy this wine in the United States. Yes, you can definitely buy in the United States and I will show you the website. Just go into the website and they have distributors all over the United States. Um, let's see if it, wait a minute, where's Gvaut? You know what, Miri also has this. Maybe I forgot to write the website of Gvaut. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Gvaotwinery.com and you can um, definitely order wine in the United States. Great. Uh, one question that uh, I also have, and I know that a lot of people also have, but we, we got it asked by Judy Carino, uh, Caronica, sorry, uh, is uh, a little bit more about having a physical tour of all of these great things when they come to Israel. So she's specifically asking if this tour that you just presented to us can be done in, as a one day tour and how much time would tourists get at each stops. But maybe you can tell us a little bit more also in general about touring in the Binyamin region, uh, what the best way to do so is. Uh, yeah, so there are two options. You can either come on your own, you leave Jerusalem, let's go back to the map. Um, leave Jerusalem in a rented car, and it's always better in a rented car because the public bus transportation is not wonderful. It's it's a po it's possible. It's not, and then you just stop uh, wherever you want. But the first stop I would suggest is right by Migron. It's the visitor center uh, for the Benjamin region. There's a really nice girl named Morielle. She's at the desk with maps available and all the options. There is biking, hiking, um, rappelling. Um, you can you can go on an ATV trip, you can go to wineries, whatever you're looking for. And some people contact me personally uh, to organize a, a, per, a private tour for them. And then I ask them what their interests are, show them all the options, and then we, we create a day together. You can do this and more can be done in one day. Um, and some people like to come for two days and stay in the region, but you don't have to because from Jerusalem to Ali, for example, that's only an hour. 
and an hour drive. So even if it took us the whole day to stop and get to Ailey, it's only an hour back to your hotel or bed and breakfast or home or whatever in Jerusalem. And there's the Western part of Benjamin that hopefully we'll go on another tour of this area sometime. That's closer to Modi'in. It's also very beautiful. This is where Mary lives in this region. It's also the story of Hanukkah. Uh, so there's, there's really is a lot to see. And then there's this part of the region, which I hope we'll do another either virtual tour, real tour of Nofei Prat, Kfar Adumim, Mitzpericho. It's the, the desert, but it's only 10 minutes from Jerusalem and you're in the Judean desert, which is incredible. I can I can announce already that we're preparing a tour with uh, the Regavim uh, organization, uh, which is a little bit of more of a political tour uh, of this region, an illegal uh, building by Bedouins sponsored by the European Union uh, in this area. And so this tour will right. be announced in the next few weeks. It's really about this region next to Nofe Prat and Faradumi. Uh, another question that was asked is about the, the origins of the name Binyamin. Okay, so... Um... This is the tribal inheritance of Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. So Benjamin is Benjamin in Hebrew. And the tribal inheritance is this area. And right here in Ofra is the border between Benjamin and Ephraim. Benjamin and Ephraim, two, the two Shvatim, part of the 12 tribes. Um, the inheritance is divided up to the, the land is divided up to the 12 tribes in Shiloh. We read about this at the beginning in the in the book of Joshua chapter 18 when Joshua comes in with the children of Israel after seven years of conquering seven years of settling and God tells Joshua to divide up the land there's a lottery and each tribe uh, wins the lottery in a different region and a different area of land what's interesting that today no matter where you live in Israel unless you're like in a big city uh, it will see it will say post office box your, your address will have the P post office box and the name of the biblical region on your on your mail, which is pretty cool. Uh, one interesting question is also about the different types of artisanships uh, and craftsmanship that you discuss uh, that existed 2000 years ago that still exists. Uh, can you speak a little bit about uh, the connection? And I, what, one thing that I'm interested in hearing is do people choose to do these things because of the history that there is in this reason, region or did it just happen this way? How did that happen that those people are doing these things in those same areas? Okay, that's an excellent question. I'm actually organizing a birthday for someone um, this this Thursday live, a real <laughs> real birthday, a real tour. Um, I hope it'll work out. Things are, are, are slowly um, opening up. We've been in lockdown for a really long time. And I'm taking them to a biblical crafter named Suri. It's right by ancient Chilo. We're going to ancient Chilo. We're going to pray at the place of, of the site of Hana. And then we're going to Suri. And her passion is learning and teaching biblical crafts. She's a special person. And I, there are a lot of very interesting and special people living in the region. And I think the people that work in tourism, they, like, they understand that the region is so rich in history biblical history and whatever. So you have pottery studios and some of, the, some of them use uh, different biblical and ancient style methods. We have the blacksmith with his story. Uh, we have Sori who, we're, what we're doing this week is basket weaving and she's gonna talk about the connection. And we also, in Shiloh, you can make the incense, the Torah, like in ancient times. It's not exactly the same because according to Jewish law, you're not allowed to make it exactly the same, but we make it for Havdalah. So there are a lot of people who um, live locally, make, create local produce, but there's always a connection, even the olive oil. Uh, I take a lot of people towards Hanukkah time. This is where the olive picking season is coming. Uh, but the, the story of Hanukkah of the Maccabees that was right here in the region. It was right across from where I live, Ma'ale Levona, um, near Nevet Suf and Chashmonaim, Modi'in. This is all, this is Matitiao. My parents live in Matitiao. This is the story of Hanukkah. And there, and when you when you learn the story and you come to the region, you see the olive trees and how they make the olive oil, just like in ancient times, you understand that everything's connected. So I think that a lot of the people that live in the region that have learned the history say, "Wow, we are re." There's a lot of excitement of us returning to the ancient biblical land, returning to our roots and to our history, and then re recreating that connection. So you'll find very many 
uh, artisans and, and, and crafts, and, but not only, not only. Great, we have one question from uh, Goldie Steiner. Uh, Goldie is uh, leading the organization called Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, which ZOA has a developing relationship with, and we're very proud of it. Uh, let me just read you the question that she asked. One second. Uh, can you tell us who and when you expect the application of sovereignty to be revisited uh, to Judea and Samaria, not in parts, but to the entire land from the river to the sea? Uh, enough of the Salami tactic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the question you want to answer. I'll, I'll tell you something. I I'll answer on, on, a perf on a personal side. Um, I'm excited to live where I live. Uh, I'm the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor. My parents left everything in San Francisco. My husband's parents left their families in Paris to come to Israel. We moved up to the to this biblical historical region. But what I've learned is that there's the excitement and the people living in the region, and then there, there, there are the governments and the politicians. And we, the people living in the region, are trying desperately to make a change. Uh, I personally believe in applying sovereignty in this way or another, applying fully applying Israeli law, because I think it will solve problems for both Israelis and for Palestinians. I think we're moving in a great direction. I think it's slower than maybe what we all expected. And, and we were hoping that this past July, we would be in a different place, but it's definitely moving in the right direction. We need to have patience because on the ground, there are huge changes happening and, and I definitely believe it will happen sometime soon. Uh, we just need to, we need patience, we need prayer. And, um, and facts on the ground, uh, we have 500,000 Israelis living in the region, young couples from all over waiting to move in. We just, um, that they're gonna start building hundreds of new apartments and homes in Judea and Samaria, and, and that will bring more people. And I think that will, it's creating a change. And so I definitely believe that we're on that path. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. I, I, I'll say that my own personal position, and I think it's also ZOA's official position, is that you're asking when it, it should be done and it should have been done already in the past and th that we're already late in applying uh, sovereignty. It should have been done in 1967 because this is our land uh, and it should be recognized as our land. Uh, that, that, thank you so much, Eliana. Uh, one, one second, Alan wants to tell me something. No, Dan, just look at your uh, emails, your messages. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Eliana, uh, for this incredible tour. It was really fascinating. Thank you also, Miri, uh, for helping organizing it, and Jackie and Alan from ZOA for helping uh, also uh, with uh, running this uh, webinar. Thank you everyone for uh, being part of this uh, webinar. As you know, we have a lot of programs uh, that we try to do uh, during the COVID uh, uh, crisis uh, in order to get some quality content, both from Israel and from uh, the United States to everyone, some relevant content about Israel and Zionism. Uh, if you like this program and if you like all of our program and if you like the things that we do, then we encourage you uh, to donate. You can uh, to donate to the ZOA. You can donate through our website at zoa.org. Uh, I will just announce one program that we have coming up uh, Wednesday, October 28th at 1 p.m. We have the ZOA Book Club uh, where we will uh, be uh, reading To Heal the World, How the Jewish Left Corrupts Judaism and Endangers Israel featuring author Jonathan Newman. Uh, and if you wanna hear about more of the webinars that we organize, then we encourage you again to uh, follow us on social media, to follow us uh, on our website, and you'll get all of that news. Uh, we're sure that we'll have more programs with Miri and Eliana in the future because we liked her this time and last time. Uh, and we hope to see you in all of our future programs. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for having me.